welcome, Connor. Thanks so much for doing this. It's such a pleasure to, to have you during this whole crazy time we're going through. Connor, would, would you just talk a little bit about where we are in the world? I know that when the pandemic hit, you had a show on Broadway and you had a show on the West End. Tell us about your experience with that. Let's just start there. It's great to be here, Kurt. Thank you so much for this. Uh, it's lovely to see you. Well, I was in New York and we were rehearsing Girl from the North Country and we were getting our show ready to open at the Belasco Theatre. We were rehearsing, we moved into the theatre, we were in previews. And as we opened our show on Broadway, it was a very strange feeling because on one level it was great to have the show open and we had a great uh, opening night and a nice uh, party afterwards and all of that. But really, I'd say 70 to 80 percent of the people that were there, we were all saying everything is going to get shut down. It has to. And then I got home around the 10th of March, 11th of March, maybe. And two days later, the U.S. closed its borders to European Union citizens and the day after I got home, all the schools in Ireland closed and suddenly everywhere was going into was going into shutdown. So the set for that show, as I'm sure in your theatre, is uh, still sitting there on the stage. The ghost lights are on this, the stages. It's quite a strange thing. Could you just speak a little bit about the communal experience of theatre and perhaps the necessity of it? It never seems to me to be that theatre is ever in danger because you think the reason it's still here after all these thousands of years is because it's doing something that no other art form can do. I think it's a need for ritual in some way, which is very deep in the, in the human psyche. I think that theater, as we know, evolved probably from religious services, people gathering at some kind of altar, replaying a story of some kind. And that's really, I think, what it is. The audience sitting there in the dark, there is a, a very real, very unique, trance-like experience occurring, which serves a, a great need. Just talk about your process. How do you do it, Connor? I always feel to write something, especially something original, you know, you'd have to have that old fashioned concept of feeling inspired. You know, it has to be something that comes into your mind that comes and stays there as something that you begin to twist over in your mind. And if you're a playwright, that's just where you want to be. You have this ghostly little thing that's playing over and you're, you're looking at it and you're, who's this? And, what's that? and then you start to eventually start to jot down a few little notes. For me, anyway, this is how I do it. I find that I have to fool myself into believing that I'm not actually writing, that I'm just making notes. And then you're in this kind of psychological war with yourself, which is that uh, inevitably you know that what you're doing is not very good or you feel it's not very good, but you've got to, in some way, again, fool yourself. Well, that's not important because I'm not really writing anything anyway. It's just a few ideas for something that I may write at some some point when I'm, you know, a much more stable uh, psychological specimen. Eventually you sort of have enough that you think, well, what I might do now with all these notes is I might start to organize this and I start to type something. So it's kind of like a constant game of psychological warfare with yourself. You have done various adaptations over the years. It's a lovely thing to do. And I think a lot of playwrights really enjoy doing it. It has none of the stress and anxiety of doing an, or, an original piece, you know, because uh, really all the hard work has already been done, obviously. I remember seeing Brian Friel's um, version of Uncle Vanya, and he had whole bits in that that weren't in Uncle Vanya. You know, he just had whole speeches that, were, that he made up. I would describe it as, um, it's like acupuncture rather than surgery. You're just trying to hit into a little, something that just releases energy. So it's kind of like that, and just so that it keeps flowing. You know, that's, that's what you're trying to do. Connor, I'd love to go to the, your beginnings. You were born and raised in Dublin, right? Mm -hmm. You went to UCD? I did, yes. At that point, I was just playing music in bands a lot and not really functioning very well as a, as a student. But my parents prevailed on me to put my application in for arts in UCD. And so I went and studied philosophy and English. There was a drama society there, Dramstock, and I began to get involved there. I really started to enjoy getting into plays. I remember in my last year at school, we'd read Death of a Salesman, you know, that really turned me on to something. And in my first or second year in college, I started to write little plays. And I heard you actually ran your own theatre company. Well, yes. Then during the summers and between the academic years, uh, some of us from the Drama Society would get together and we'd do little lunchtime plays in 
in venues around Dublin. And so I learned a lot, you know, in that time. I'd like you for the record to tell us what the name of your theatre company was. Fly by Night Theatre Company. In those early days, did they present premieres of Conor McPherson's plays? It was all new plays we did, yes. It was by me and there was another writer, Colin O'Connor, and we wrote the plays and our friends would, would all act in them and we would do them. We did lots. I mean, I'd say we did about 10 productions. I understand that you acted in some of these. Yeah, you know, I did some acting. It was very interesting. It was a good experience to have. I'm still in awe of how actors do it. I think it's just such a mysterious and amazing gift. The play that was a, like a breakout play for you was this Lime Tree Bower, I think. You actually stayed in Ireland and live in Ireland and work in Ireland. You're still there, but yet you found your voice, perhaps, or perhaps you found your audience in another country. Yes, well, with this Lime Tree Bower, we got to a place with our little the theatre company where people um, were finding it difficult to survive. You know, people needed to make a living and it was very hard. And um, we'd sort of whittled down to those sort of very few of us left doing it. So I was asked if I wanted to use the um, the theatre in Dublin Castle, which was the crypt of the church in there. Well, the first Dublin Fringe Festival was happening and they offered it to me for two weeks. I managed to sort of scrape together enough resources to put on this play, but it was almost like a last ditch attempt. We did that play and some friends of mine who had uh, asked me to write a film script uh, knew an agent from London, Nick Marston, who was um, over at the Dublin Theatre Festival and um, they said, you know, you should come and see this play by our friend. It's on in the crypt. And he came to see it and I was introduced to him in the in Brogan's, which is the pub across the road from Dublin Castle there on, on Dame Street. And he said to me, um, I think we could get this get this on in London. And so within a month or two of that, he contacted me and said, I think, you know, you should come over to London. So I went to London and I decided to do it at the Bush Theatre because they said they'd be happy for me to direct my own production or bring up the production that I had done in Dublin. And so I did. I brought that production over. And then from that point on, they said, um, we have a position here of a writer in residence, if you'd like to apply for that. So I applied for that. And the Royal Court, even though we hadn't you know, done that play, this Lantry Barrett, they said, well, would you like to do another play for us instead? I had already started or had written The Weir, and I said to them, well, what about this? And so from that point on, I was, you know, really working a lot in London. Were you working and living in London during your residency there? And is that where you started to write The Weir? At that time, I was in a relationship with a girl who had a job at the University of Leicester. And so I used to spend my time between Dublin, where I was still living with my parents, and to Leicester, where my girlfriend was, and down to London, where I was kind of working quite a bit. So I was kind of on this loopy triangle of not having anywhere particular for myself to live, but coming and going a lot. So that was how, for that year or two, that was where I was. You like, and it's important to you, that you direct at least the first production of your own play. So how come you didn't do that with the Weir? Well, I met Ian Rickson at the Royal Court, who was asking me to do a play for them and I liked Ian. I don't know, I just um, just decided maybe he should do it. And also as well, Ian was incredibly um, cooperative and very open and welcoming. Like he wanted me to be at all the auditions, for instance, you know, so I was at every audition. And when you're that age as a playwright too, you, you do that, you know, you yeah, I'll go to all the auditions. So I was at all the auditions and all the rehearsals, you know, and all that kind of thing. I was very much part of it. Tell us about the weir and what kernel of an idea that first drew you into this story and follow up on that is what is your relationship to Leitrim? The weird thing is I used to go and um, see my granddad who lived in Leitrim and I remember one time being in the little local um, bar in Jamestown there there was nobody there you know and I saw the farmer come in local farmer and he he just went in straight behind the bar and he just poured himself a drink you know and he had the wellies on and like the big you know <laughs> mullicky you know fingers like potatoes, you know, and he just poured himself a drink. From that moment, because that's the first thing that sort of happens in, in the weir, you know, someone comes in and just goes in behind the bar and just, and you, I, it was just, it seemed like such a different world. And then I don't know where the idea came from for the people telling each other ghost stories, but I started to uh, you know, think of or to collect these ideas of these ghost stories. The first story in the play that they say was, um, that was a story that my granddad actually told me that it happened to him when he was growing up. He grew up in Port Leash. That was a story that he told me about the fairy road and this knocking on the door at the house and this kind of stuff. The next story in it was one I think I heard on a on maybe on a radio talk show or something like that that someone that I got that from the next ones I, I made up 
So I remember over that time writing that script, but I can remember too, it didn't take me very long to write. The way that I used to write then, maybe I don't write quite so much like that now is, but I would just write something a few pages and then I wouldn't write anything for a few weeks. And then I'd write a few more and I wouldn't write any more for a few weeks. Then I'd come back when I knew the next thing that I was going to write. So I just keep writing these little four page bursts. I do about 10 of those and that would be the play. With the weir, it was really a first draft and I gave it to my young sister, Margaret. I asked her, would she type it up? I had an electric typewriter. Like no one had computers <laughs> back then. <laughs> but, uh, and I gave her a hundred pounds. There was no euros. And she typed it up. I remember her saying at the time, she said, you know, I think this is very good. You know, when she was typing it up. So I sent that off to the Royal Court, to Ian Rickson then. And I was over in London and we met. We went and we sat in a little cafe where there's very little room. Everyone's kind of squashed in little tables. We found a little table upstairs and he took out the script and he had a pencil you know and he just asked me a few questions about a few little things you know and I said oh no well I think that's just a mistake or that's a typo so we just tidied it up and he just asked me a few questions that was it we didn't there was no more rewriting ever happened on that play which story did you make up is Valerie's story a story you made up yes I remember reading something on a plane I remember in a, in the in-flight magazine it was something about unexplained things that if you rang a certain number, you could hear a voice on the line and people were wondering, was it to do with activating uh, sleeper cell agents in countries who were sort of in deep hypnosis? Then they'd be given this number and they'd ring a, a line and they'd get this code word that would trigger them to go and do some act of terrorism or something. That just got that idea of the phone idea in my mind. And um, so I always remember that being the kernel of that story strangely i guess there's five stories within it because each one of them yeah. had a story did you begin with those and then fill in the other parts yeah and i mean i suppose they came you know each one after the other i probably didn't i never really probably worked it out very consciously particularly and then the bits in the middle were just joining them up that was the way that i i saw it you know but you can see the play being written as you watch it i mean you see it's like one person comes onto the stage and sort of does something and then a few minutes later, someone else arrives and then they start to talk and exchange information. Then another person arrives and starts to, you know, so you can actually see it sort of being written, you know, and uh, it's very organic. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and you're we're sort of we're finding out what's going on as they're finding out and as a writer, I'm finding out, you know, so it was a little bit like that, I suppose. You didn't do much re rewrites then on that one during rehearsal? Nothing. It's so strange now because I would never do that now. Although I don't normally work with directors, directors will try and stop you a lot of the time destroying things. You lose your nerve sometimes. You're just like, oh no, let's not do this. Let's cut that. So maybe Ian was much more, he believed in it. And he was just, oh no, no, this is, this is fine. We'll make that work. Well, you've done extraordinarily well on the many other productions that you've directed. Shining City, that was a terrific success for us and for yourself. Did you direct that one originally? Yes, we did at the Royal Court in London. That production, we had Stanley Townsend, who was just recently in New York Theatre. I was in the original production, a lovely Irish cast, Michael McElhatton, and um, the late Tom Murphy and Cathy Kira Clark. It was a very nice production, that one. And we did it in Dublin at the Gate Theatre as well. They, they were a lovely cast. In Shining City, which we did with Matthew Broderick, Billy Carter, and James Russell yeah. and Lisa Dwan, it was a terrific production for us. This is a very personal question, and you can just absolutely plead the fifth. Have you ever been in therapy? Did this come from any first-hand experience? Um, perhaps it kind of did, but I think in some way too, I mean, it's very much influenced by the Gili concert. Often plays that I do, do have a little bit of a kernel in other plays. Like I think the weird for me probably comes a bit from conversations on Homecoming. They end up being very different plays, but in some way both Weir and um, Shining City seem to come from Tom Murphy plays for me. Was Tom Murphy a seminal influence on you? I think he was and a, a strangely confounding um, influence I think for a lot of writers because Tom Murphy was so his own kind of writer was very uncompromising in his vision. And I think that that was probably quite fascinating for young writers in, in a sense, because it was hard sometimes to make head or tail of what was going on, in, you know, but in a, in a very good way, because they had that real messiness of a real life and a real vision going on around them. Whereas I think with Brian Friel, I think the audience were never in any doubt 
as to what was happening, what the play was about, you know. And whereas uh, with Tom Murphy's plays, I can remember seeing um, the first time I saw his play, um, The House, I think it was, I didn't understand it at all. And then the next time I saw it, I thought it was one of the best plays I'd ever seen. He's a fascinating writer. So for me, yeah, Shining City in some sense was coming out of the impact that the Geely concert had on me. That was a play I read a lot. You came to the opening night of the Seafarer and afterwards we were walking up the street to the opening night party and you turned to me and you said, you know, that play that we saw tonight, that's a very Catholic play. And you looked at me inquiringly and I was thinking, well, you wrote it, pal. Do you go generally to see your own work much anymore? And do you have a detachment from the play? Or can you just like sit there and think, oh, this is an interesting play? So I remember that night and I remember our conversation and I don't really ever go to see my work at all. You know, normally I find it very difficult. I don't think I'm alone in that. I think there are a lot of writers that find it very difficult to look at their work. It's a self-consciousness, it's a difficulty. I think when you're directing your own thing, you're more the director than the writer, actually. And the play is a set of problems you're trying to solve and you're not thinking about it so much as a writer anymore. You're just trying to make it work with these actors so yes when you go to see something like I saw the seafarer that night in your wonderful production there I hadn't seen it probably since I had done it so it was over 10 years so yes I was able to see it it was just like going to mass it was just all about God and the devil and sins and you know what I mean and then but that's all right you know I, I didn't mind that at all. You went to the Marist school you were obviously brought up with the robes swishing around you and probably some leather belts swishing around yeah, you too. Yeah, exactly. do, do, you, do you find that that has made an in, indelible mark upon you? Oh definitely definitely I do yes I do you know and in a way you know I think I'm grateful for it actually because I think um, you grow up and you sort of you can you know you throw off those old coats or whatever that were put on you and you could f find your own way it gives you great storytelling um experience actually having that that kind of education because it is it's a, it's it's pure stories isn't it that's all it is you're just getting story after story and also the sense of the mystery that's what it's about and that's what plays are about it's like the mystery at the heart of the play and at the heart of any ritual and the heart of life that's what we're there to celebrate it when we go see a play and we all go into theatre like the Irish rep and we sit down and this thing unfolds. I think we're engaging in a mystery. I think that's what's so fascinating about it. I think like that almost any of your plays, it is a quest for, for salvation of some kind. I think all of those plays do um, distill down to something very, very simple, you know, which is that it's not just that you're a person in a, in a certain society or in a certain family or a certain situation. You're actually a consciousness in a cosmic situation, which is that you're alive and you don't know where you came from or if any of it means anything. You know, it's that simple. And, you know, that's, that's your situation. And everything else flows from that, as far as I'm concerned. We recently, this season, did one of your plays called Dublin Carol. It's certainly a dark journey of a man who is, again, seeking salvation, having been, you know, wasted by a life of alcohol. This was a very personal story of yours. Is there anything there you could share with us about the writing of it or where you got the inspiration for it? Yeah, I mean, at that time when I wrote that, certainly I was, um, you know, my relationship with drinking and alcohol was, yeah, really, really a, a poor, a poor relationship. It was not a good one. I wasn't in great shape at all you know, in, in that way. And so like a lot of young people wasn't sure how to figure my way out of all of that stuff, you know. And uh, yeah, so just found myself kind of writing that play, which is very, a lot of fear in that play, I think. That's the big, the big emotion in that play. Then when I uh, stopped drinking, I was 29. A couple of years later, so in about 2003, Neil Pepe down at the Atlantic asked me, did I want to do Dublin Carol there with Jim? you know, Jim Norton. So we did it. And so I wasn't drinking anymore. A friend of mine came to see it. And I remember saying to him, um, who's going to want to watch this play? You know, I said, like, who's going to want to watch this? I remember he, he said to me, he said, what are you talking about? He said, all this play is about is about someone up there going, I can't live here. He says, everybody feels like that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you a little bit about Girl from the North Country and how much, if any, collaboration you had with Dylan on it? The great thing about the collaboration I had with Bob Dylan on Girl from the North Country was that he just gave me total carte blanche, never bothered me, never wanted to know what we were, <laughs> we were doing, what songs we were using how we were doing it. He just gave us total freedom. I remember um, talking to his manager 
at one point just saying, listen, I just want to check with you, you know, do you think we should send a tape of this to him or a video or so? Does he want to see a rehearsal? He said, you know, no. He says it's better if Bob stays out of it because if he gets involved, you're probably going to want to change it because, you know, if Bob says, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? It's very difficult for you then to sort of not do that. And Bob sort of knows that. So he's just letting you have the freedom, you know. He was right, you know, it was amazing. It's kind of like he, he just stayed right out of it. Did he see it early or did he see it at all, actually? He came to see it then when he was in New York at the Public Theatre. He was doing a, a residency at the Beacon Theatre. So he was doing 10 nights there and then he had a night off and I got an email to say that he was going to come down and, and, and see the show. So he came down to see it and a few of our cast were going to go and see his concert at the Beacon on their night off, which was the following night. And I got an email from his manager to say, Bob would love to meet any of the cast who are around. So he very very graciously spent time he brought them up to his backstage to his dressing room and they sat around and chatted about the show for about an hour so then it was amazing that they went and watched his concert they were saying he was just so humble he was so nice he just was really complimentary about it and it was lovely to get that feedback finally about the show so i was able to get everything that that he was saying to them he told them you know that he sort of saw the songs, they were coming at him, like he didn't know what to expect. I think it was a lovely surprise for him, you know, just because we, we picked a lot of different songs from all kinds of different parts of his career, not necessarily um, ones that were singles or hits. And he enjoyed that aspect of it. And uh, he was just hugely complimentary. This is the one of the first pieces you did that has music in a very major way. Has it inspired you to maybe want to think of actually writing a full-blown musical? Yeah, I mean, I would never say no to that. I think what's good about Girlfriend in North Country is it's a lovely experiment in a way to just be given all these songs and just just do what you want with them. That's a lovely way to, to do one. To have to do one where it's all going to be new music and new lyrics is... Uh, that's in a sense a whole set of other problems. So I think doing that way was was a great way to dip my toe into it for sure, you know. And also because there were so many songs to choose from. Like Bob Dylan has written like five or six hundred songs. If we wanted to try another song, we could just try anything we wanted. Connor, I can't just thank you enough. Thank you so much for this. This was just Not amazing. At all. No, it's great. I'm delighted to be here. You're absolutely lovely and so smart, Connor. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you. It's been lovely to spend a bit of time with you guys, and I hope we'll see you now on the other side of this we'll all be together again soon i hope i'm sure we will oh.